Hello, third grade, and welcome to lesson two of our survival unit. This lesson, we're going to be focusing on animal adaptation. So over here, we're in unit five, or module five, lesson two, adaptations. Let's watch our short video, and then we're going to jump into our pages together. I know you are around here somewhere. I can hear you. Oh, hello. I'm Owen, and I'm searching for a gorilla's Pennsylvania gus. That's a field cricket to most people. I love capturing photos of insects. I place the photos in my science journal and write about them. When I grow up, I want to be an entomologist. An entomologist is a scientist who studies insects. Did you know that there are still millions of insects scientists haven't discovered yet? Maybe someday I will discover one of them. There you are. All right, let's go ahead and get into our lesson content. So remember, this, is, uh, this lesson is titled Adaptations, and we're going to begin with our first page where you're reading about different kinds of adaptations. You're going to read the small scenario here and decide which of the friends you agree with the most. Then you're going to complete the bottom part explaining why you agree with that particular friend. Make sure you use complete sentences, proper punctuation, and remember to capitalize where you need to capitalize. Once you've completed that, we're going to move on to our next page and we're going to explore our digital interactive that's titled Different Birds and Observe the Photos. So you're, we're going to take a look at the pictures of the different kinds of birds. The birds are similar to each other in some ways and very different in others. What questions do you have? So remember, you're going to write down at least three questions that you have about the different kinds of birds. Click on the slides to see photos of different birds. How are the birds similar? How are they different? All right, let's take a look. Here's our first photo. Let's go back. Our second photo. Our third photo. and our fourth photo. So these four pictures show different kinds of birds. Think about how they're the same and how they're different, and then write at least three questions that you can think of relating to these different birds. Once you've completed that, you're going to read the STEM Career Connection about the ornithologist and answer the questions we have here on the back page. What is one of the differences between a bee hummingbird and a cassowary? And number two, what does the ornithologist say that all birds have in common? So there's your two questions. And then you're going to give your essential question your best try. How do adaptations help plants and animals to survive? Use what you've learned from previous lessons and your best guess. And then we're going to work more towards understanding this question and finding the answers to it as we go through our lesson together. Now, once completed, we're going to jump into an activity called bird beak adaptations. This is an activity that's a lot of fun. What we're going to do here is obviously, of course, first we make our prediction. So let's read through the instructions. How does beak shape affect a bird? You will observe how birds with different types of beaks gather food by creating a model of the beaks. Read the investigation before you make a prediction. Make a prediction. How does the shape of a bird's beak affect its ability to gather different types of food? To carry out the investigation, for number one, collect a plastic spoon, tweezers, a binder clip, and a pair of scissors. These will represent the bird beaks. Place four cardboard box lids in front of you. Fill each lid with one of the following, paper clips, rubber bands, toothpicks, and dried macaroni. These will represent bird food. Hold a plastic cup in one of your hands as, and one of the bird beak models in the other hand. The plastic cup will represent a bird's stomach. Your teacher will set a timer for 20 seconds. When the timer starts, use one bird beak model to collect as much of one type of food as possible. Collect food by using the beaks to move the food into the cup. Record data. 
Count the amount of food you were able to collect. Record your data in the table on the next page. Repeat steps four and five until you've collected each food type with each beak model. So you're going to be collecting paper clips, rubber bands, toothpicks, and macaroni. You're going to try collecting these with a spoon. You'll try collecting these with tweezers. You'll try collecting them with binder clips and you'll try collecting with scissors. Which bird beak worked best for each type of food? Use evidence to support your ideas. So don't just answer the question, but explain why. Tell me based on your data, what information you gathered, what you were able to find and how that uh, supports your answer. For number two, compare your results with a classmate's results. Are they the same? What do you think it might mean if the results were different? Once you've completed that, we're going to move on to our next pages. And we are going to re we're going to watch actually animals in their own environment on things that help animals in different types of environments survive. And we're going to answer the questions. We're also going to go over the vocabulary words that we have here. Our first word is the word adaptation. Then we have the word camouflage, mimicry, hibernation and migration. So let's go through and take a look at the meanings of these different vocabulary words. Now an adaptation is a structure or behavior that helps an organism survive in its environment. Camouflage is an adaptation that allows an organism to blend into its surroundings. This is really helpful when it needs to hide from predators. Mimicry is an adaptation in which one kind of organism looks like another kind uh, in color and in shape. So for this, you can think of uh, leaf bugs or stick bugs that look like the leaf on a plant or they look like a twig. These adaptations help them to survive because they don't look like insects. So birds may not notice that they're insects, so it helps to keep them alive. Hibernation means to rest or go into a deep sleep through the cold winter and migration means to move from one place to another. A lot of animals and insects will migrate uh, during the winter to go from a cold environment into a warmer one, just like monarch butterflies will migrate during the winter uh, to go somewhere warm where they can lay their eggs. All right, let's go ahead and we're going to watch animals in their own environment. What kind of animals can live in the desert? It's a hot, dry place with little rainfall. How about these animals? Hmm, let's look at the shark. It's got big teeth. Those are probably helpful in the desert, but it needs to be underwater all the time. Nope, a shark does not belong in the desert. And let's look at the polar bear. A polar bear likes snow and ice. What's his favorite meal? Fish. A polar bear definitely does not live in a desert. Here's a wolf. The wolf lives on dry land, so the desert might be okay. A wolf eats lots of animals, so that's a fit. But that's a very thick fur coat. A wolf would get very, very hot under the desert sun. The wolf is not a desert animal. Now let's look at the rattlesnake. That tough skin is good for traveling over rocks. A rattlesnake does not live in or need to drink much water. To cool off, a rattlesnake can bury itself or curl up in some shade. A rattlesnake is a good desert animal. All right, now that we've finished watching our short video, we're going to answer question number one, what characteristics of the rattlesnake help it to survive in the desert? After you've answered with a complete sentence, we're going to jump into our textbook and read pages 94 and 95. And we're going to answer questions two and three. Question number two says, what are the three main ways that adaptations help organisms survive in their environment? And question number three says, how does camouflage help an organism to survive? So keep those questions in mind while we read together. Adaptations and behaviors. Adaptations. A frog sees an insect. The frog's long sticky tongue springs out and catches the insect. The tongue curls back in and the frog swallows its food whole. A frog's tongue is an example of an adaptation. 
An adaptation is a structure or behavior that helps an organism survive in its environment. Energy. Every living thing is adapted to get energy. The leaves of an elm tree capture sunlight to make food. Mountain lions have sharp teeth and claws to catch deer and other animals. The flat teeth of horses are perfect for chewing grass. A polar bear has an adaptation called camouflage, which means it blends into its environment. Covered with white fur, the polar bear has, is hard to see on white snow and ice. That makes it easier for the bear to catch seals for food. The frog uses its sticky tongue to capture an insect to eat. Safety. Camouflage also helps living things stay safe. A snake's skin pattern may match the ground it lies on, making it hard for a predator to see. A turtle's shell is another adaptation for staying safe. When a turtle is in danger, it can pull its head, legs, and tail inside the shell. Plants also have adaptations for staying safe. Holly plants have spines on the edges of their leaves. The spines stop many animals from eating the plants. Protection from the weather. Sea lions and walruses are adapted to living in cold climates. They have a layer of fat called blubber under their skin that helps them stay warm. An Arctic fox grows a thick white coat when winter is coming. That coat keeps the fox warm, even in very cold weather. Some animals use adaptations to survive in hot temperatures, such as in the desert. Camels have, a thick have thick leathery patches on their knees. The patches protect their legs so they are not burned when the camel kneels. Because of its camouflage, the snake will be hard for a hawk flying overhead to see. A camel has thick fur on its back that provides shade. Thinner fur on other parts of its body let heat escape. Did you know a mimic octopus can change its movements and the arrangements of its parts to look like 15 different organisms, including sea snakes, brittle stars, giant crabs, and stingrays. All right, let's go ahead and answer our two questions. What were the three main ways that adaptation helps an organism to survive in its environment? So over here, you can see our three headers. It helps them to uh, get energy, to stay safe, and to protect them from the weather. How does camouflage help an organism to survive? Again, over here, you're going to go into camouflage and see why, why camouflage is important. Camouflage helps an animal to blend its, into its environment, so it makes it easier for it to uh, hunt, other, hunt its prey or to hide from other predators. Now we're going to skip over page 192 and jump into page 193, and here we're going to read pages 96 and 97 in the Science Handbook. And we're going to answer question number five and six, what adaptation helps desert plants live for long periods of time without water? And number six, which color of body coverings helps desert animals survive in their environment and why? Page 96, desert adaptations. A desert is a very dry environment. It rarely rains in a desert. When rain does fall, it can pour down heavily. Temperatures are often very hot during the day and cold at night. Organisms that live in a desert have adaptations to help them survive in, their, in these conditions. Water. Desert plants cannot depend on regular rain for their water. Instead, their roots are adapted to spread out wide and reach down deeply to find water. A desert plant has stem ad stems adapted for storing water. Some plants have thorns to keep away animals that might eat the stems or fruit. Many desert animals get their water by eating plants and other animals. Mesquite tree. Small leaves do not lose much water. Thorns protect the tree from hungry and thirsty animals. Long roots grow deep underground where they can find stored water. Saguaro cactus. Spines help protect the cactus from animals. A waxy coating helps seal the water in. Wide, shallow roots can quickly soak up the little rain that does fall. Thick stems help store the water. The diagram shows two different desert plants that get water from soil. Read the labels to understand the differences, which is what we just did. Temperature. 
Desert animals have adaptations to help them from being too hot during the day. Coyotes and rattlesnakes are nocturnal. This means they are active at night when the desert is cool. They sleep in the daytime when it's hot. Jackrabbits stay cool having, by having thin bodies and long ears. This adaptation helps the heat escape from their bodies. Warm blood flows, from a jackrabbit, flows to a jackrabbit's large ears. Once there, heat is released into the air. Some animals have pale colored bodies. Pale colors absorb less heat. Snakes and lizards stay out of the blazing sun by hiding in holes or under rocks. Vultures and eagles soar high above the hot desert sands. The air is cooler when they fly. Warm blood flows through the jackrabbit's ears. Some of the heat escapes into the air. This bat is nocturnal. It sleeps in the daytime when the desert is hot. At night, it eats nectar from cactus flowers. All right, so we'll go ahead and answer these two questions. What adaptations help desert plants live for long periods of time without water? So the two diagrams we talked about. Number six, what colors of body coverings help desert animals survive in their environment and why? Now that information you're going to find um, in this page in the section on temperature. And you're going to find your answer here in the second paragraph. All right, once we've completed that, we're going to read pages 98 and 99, and we're going to answer questions seven and eight. What are two main types of forests? How are, how are they similar and different? Number eight, how does hibernation help animals survive in a temperate forest? Forest adaptations. A forest is an environment in which many trees go, grow near one another. The tops of tall trees are in sunlight. Plants on the forest floor live in shade. Most organisms are adapted to life in the treetops. Others live on the ground. Forest plants. Tropical rainforests are very wet places. Too much water can harm plant leaves. Some leaves have grooves and drip tips that allow water to drain off easily. Little sunlight reaches beneath the treetops. Plants living on the dim forest floor have large leaves to catch as much sunlight as possible. A temperate forest where winters are cold and a, a temperate forest grows where winters are cold and dry. In winter, there is less sunlight for plants to make food. Many trees have adapted by shedding their leaves each autumn. Without leaves, the trees need less water. These leaves have stopped making food. They drop off in the fall. In spring, the tree will grow new leaves. Rainwater drops off the tips of these leaves. Forest animals. Animals have many different adaptations for survival in the forest. Mimicry. A stick insect looks so much like a stick that other animals don't notice it. Mimicry occurs when one living thing looks like another. Mimicry gives an animal a way to be hidden without, when not moving. It can help an organism hunt without being seen. Defense. When a predator comes after a skunk, the skunk sprays a stinky chemical at it. A porcupine defends itself with many sharp quills. Its quills come off easily and stick into any attacking animal. Hibernation. During the winter in a temperate forest, the temperature is cold. Food is hard to find. Some animals survive by going into hibernation. Hibernate means to rest through the winter. Hibernating animals use little energy, and they do not eat. Dormice and bears are two animals that hibernate in the winter. The word hibernate comes from the Latin word hibernare, meaning to pass the winter. Look at the insects in this picture. The thorn mimic tree hopper looks almost the same as the thorn. Bats hibernate in sheltered areas in winter. This skunk has raised its tail and is prepared to spray a predator. Most animals see this and run away. So we talked about our two types of forests here, our tropical forests and our temperate forests, so that you're able to begin answering your questions. How are they similar? How are they different? Give examples. Number eight, how does hibernation help animals to survive? 
In the next part, we're going to look at the rabbit population in an investigation, and we're going to answer our questions. Number nine says, which color of rabbits survived better in the desert environment, in the snowy environment? Use evidence from the simulation to help explain why. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our simulation now that we've completed our readings. Okay. Welcome to Rabbit Populations. You are here to learn about the color of an animal, about how the color of an animal can help it to survive and protect it from predators. In this environment, you can add white and brown rabbits, but watch out, there are hungry hawks flying overhead that are looking to eat all the rabbits they can see. Press the next button to start your first experiment. Okay, so do you want to run your experiment in the sandy desert or in the snow? So let's start with the desert for now and see what happens. Now, our question here is, which rabbit do you think will be able to survive better in this environment, white rabbits or brown rabbits? So think about your answer. After you made your decision, add some rabbits to the desert and watch what happens. Click on the rabbits button over here. So that's what we're going to do to add rabbits to the desert. Okay, so now you can see we've got a collection of brown rabbits and white rabbits, and we've got our hawks. Now let's go ahead and see what happens to our rabbit population. Did you watch the, ha the hawks catch the rabbits? Which rabbit survived better in the desert? And why do you think that happened? Now we're going to see what happens in a snowy environment. So here we have our brown rabbits and we have our white rabbits. So pay attention to the amount of brown rabbits you have and the amount of white rabbits you have. <coughs> and see which ones are the ones that are getting caught. Okay, so now we're going to start our experiment and see what happens. So we've got four colors of rabbits here. How well do you think they're all going to survive? So we'll start with the desert one more time. And let's start adding our brown rabbits and we'll add some white rabbits and see what happens. So right now we have one, two, three, four, five, about six white rabbits and about the same number of brown rabbits. Now, as our hawks are flying around, we can see that slowly we've got fewer and fewer white rabbits, but we still have the same number of brown rabbits here. So does this match your hypothesis? Let's try adding maybe some of these white rabbits and compare them to these lighter rabbits that are a little bit darker colored than the white ones and see what happens there. Now, when you're looking at this environment from over top, you can see that both rabbits are pretty clear and they're pretty easy to see. So what do you think is going to happen? Do you think maybe the same number of rabbits are going to get caught by the hawks or the white ones might get caught more or the light brown ones might get caught more. Let's see what happens. So here we can see that both the number of rabbits decreased the same amount and that's because they were both very visible and very easy to see. Now let's try in the snow. So here we'll have our white rabbits and maybe we'll have our medium brown colored rabbits and see what happens. So they're not super dark brown, but they are still very visible. And you can see right away that the hawks are finding them and catching them, picking them up much quicker than the white rabbits. The white rabbits seem to all still be there because they camouflage, they use that adaptation to hide and blend in with the color of the snow. So here we can see that our white rabbit population is much higher than the brown rabbits that we have left over. So let's go ahead and hop back into our questions. What color rabbits survive better in the desert environment, in the snowy environment, and use evidence from your simulation to help you explain why. So you're going to answer for both of these two different environments and then give your reasons, support your answer.
Next, we're going to read pages 100 to 102 in the science handbook, and we're going to answer these questions. How do air bladders help algae in the ocean survive? What type of adaptations do ocean animals have? And why do, why do animals migrate? How have wetland plants and animals adapted and survived in this environment? So let's go ahead and hop over to our book. And we're going to flip over to page 100 all the way to 102. Let me reopen our book one moment. All right. All right, ocean adaptations. Oceans are homes to millions of living things. Each living thing has an adaptation that helps it to survive in the salty, uh, in salty water. Algae. <clears throat> Seaweed looks like plants, but they are not. They are plant-like organisms called algae. Like plants, algae make their own food from sunlight. Most algae have structures that are like leaves. Some algae have root-like structures for attaching themselves to the ocean floor. Because they need sunlight, root rooted algae can live only in the shallow water. Other algae have no roots and drift near the ocean's sunlit surface. Some algae have balloon-like air bladders. The air bladders help lift the leaf-like structures of the rooted algae towards the surface where sunlight is brighter. Air bladders are also keep afloat some algae that drift with the currents. So if you guys have been to the beach recently, you'll see when you're walking on the sand, you'll see these things that look like little bubbles that are attached to the algae and you'll see them wash up. That's what they're talking about here. Kelp is a kind of algae. This picture shows a seaweed forest of kelp. Ocean animals. Whales and dolphins breathe air. They can hold their breath for a long time as they dive deep to look for food. When they need to breathe, they rise quickly to the surface. They take in air through their holes, through holes in the top of their heads. Fish, on the other hand, have gills for oxygen from water, for getting oxygen from water. Many ocean animals have fins. Fins help them swim qu quickly and control their movement. Ocean animals swim for long distances when they migrate. Migrate means to move from one place to another. Animals migrate to find food, to reproduce, or because the water temperature has changed. Sunlight cannot reach deep in the ocean. Few organisms live there because the water is very cold. An anglerfish that lives in the deep ocean has a light on top of its head. Other animals see the light and they come towards it and become food for the fish. When sperm whales migrate, they swim in groups called pods. The whales swim together for thousands of kilometers. In the darkness of the deep ocean, the anglerfish's lighted fishing pole attracts prey. So here we're talking about different adaptations that ocean creatures have. We have the air bladders for some of the algae that helps them float up to the surface so they can get sunlight. We have um, the openings at the top of the heads of, of whales and dolphins to help them breathe. Fish have fins and gills. All of these are different adaptations. Let's go on to our next page. We'll read page 102. Wetland adaptations. In a wetland, the land is often soggy or even underwater. At other times, it's dry ground. Wetland organisms have adaptations for all of these conditions. Wetland plants. Wetland plants can survive big changes in water level. Mangrove trees live in wetlands alongside rivers or oceans. They are not washed away because their roots are spread out and grip the ground firmly. Wetland animals. Wetland animals have adaptations for when the land is covered with water. They can also live when the land is dry. A walking catfish normally lives in a pond. When the pond dries up, dries up, the fish moves an, to another pond by pulling itself over the land using its fins. 
Did you know many migrating birds stop at wetlands along their flight paths for rest, food, and water? The mangrove trees, trees roots rise up above the water. This walking catfish has adaptations to breathe air during its short trips over the ground. All right, let's go ahead and jump back and answer our questions. So how do air bladders help ocean algae, uh, help algae in the ocean survive? What type of adaptations do ocean animals have? And why do animals migrate? So these three we already talked about. How have wetland plants and animals adapted to survive in this environment? That's what we talked about last, uh, about the wetland plants and animals, and you have the examples right here in your book. Okay. Moving on, our next part is an inquiry activity titled Animal Fat. You'll investigate how fat helps keep animals warm in cold environments. Write a hypothesis. Can fat help keep your finger warm in cold water? If my finger has a layer of fat, then when placed in ice water, tell me what you think is going to happen. It will feel cold. It will uh, stay warm. Write out your hypothesis and tell me why you think that. Then we're going to carry out the investigation. We're going to spread vegetable fat over one index finger to try and coat your finger completely. And then we're going to leave the other finger, the other index finger or your pointer finger uncovered. You'll put one into the ice water and your partner is going to have a stopwatch. You're going to have your partner time how long it takes uh, or how long you can keep your finger in the water and then repeat with the other finger and record your data on a separate sheet, or you can record it here in your book. Then you're going to switch with your partner and they will complete it. You're going to answer question number 14. Did the results support your hypothesis? So is what you found out when you did the experiment the same as what you thought would happen? And then how might fat help animals survive in cold ocean environments? Once you've completed that, we're going to go on to number 15. Draw an example of an animal and their adaptations and then label their adaptations. So whatever animal you choose to draw in this space, draw it carefully, put the name of the animal, label the different parts of the animal that are adaptations that help it to survive. And that is going to take you to the end of this page. Our very last part over here is another performance task or another activity titled design a bird. So as an ornithologist, you will design a model bird that is well adapted to its environment and you'll use evidence to explain how the adaptations will help it to survive. What question will your research help you to answer? So think of a question that you want to answer. You'll use a bunch of different kinds of materials. Then you're going to describe the environment where your model bird is going to live. Describe what the bird eats and where it finds its food. Then make a sketch of your model bird below label the adaptations and identify the materials that you're going to use to build your model bird. You're going to use your classroom resources to build that model. And then you're going to answer your question, make an argument, how do adaptations help your bird survive in its environment? Use evidence from the lesson. And then you're going to answer your essential question. Think about the bird photos at the beginning of the lesson. Use the birds as an example to explain how adaptations help plants and animals survive. Once you've completed that, you're done with this lesson. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, make sure you review all of your information. You go over all of your vocabulary and reading so that you're ready for your quiz. That's it for today. Have a great day. Bye-bye.